Hello everyone. Welcome to Shankar IAS Academy's daily newspaper analysis. And today we'll be discussing the newspaper analysis of September 6th. So what are the topics of discussion? Before going to that, there is a small announcement and the pre-storming test series have started. So when is it starting? It's on the batch first is starting on 16 September 2024. And there are 48 tests on it. And the admission is going on right now. And you can use the link from the description to enroll for it. And what are the topics for discussion today? So the first topic is, can Kerala access funds from the loss and damage fund? And this article is from the Hindu. And then next topic is, Maoist setback security forces deliver major blows to Maoists, but must avoid repression. So this article is from the Hindu. And the next article is, Modi in Singapore flags India as best for creating supply chain. And this article is from the Lime Mint. Let's discuss the first article of today. So the article is, can Kerala assess funds from loss and damage fund? So this is about the recent Vainadu landslide issue. And will Kerala be getting any fund from the loss and damage fund of UNFCCC? That is this article about. So what is this loss and damage fund? So this loss and damage fund is actually created during the conference of party 27 which happened in 2022 of UNFCCC which is nothing but United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So what is this purpose? So the purpose is to support the developing countries affected by the climate change and low income countries which are more vulnerable to the climate change. And it not just covers the economic loss, it also covers the non-economic losses due to the weather and slow onset changes. So why do we focus on developing countries? That is a very big question here. So one important thing we should know about is that the developing nations are 15 times more prone to the disaster because of climate change. And what is the reason for this is that the first First and foremost thing is whenever there is a disaster that is happening due to climate change or any disaster, the developing nations might not be able to afford to balance these damages. And the second foremost thing is that most of the developing countries are placed in more vulnerable places geographically that might lead to more impacts due to the climate change. And the next point is that the financial burden. What happens is that one thing, one point is the money which is needed to take care of the damages and second is we need to compensate the damages to recover from the particular issue. So here the first thing is the vulnerability is very high and the financial burden will actually increase the vulnerability of the climate change. And next is what are all the challenges and issues related to this uh, loss and damage fund. The first and foremost thing is slow disbursement. So whenever there is an emergency due to disaster and when there is a slow disbursement of fund, there is a high chance that the impact will actually worsen. And there is a gaps in climate finance also in the developing countries, even though there are more funds related to like global environment facility, there are more funds for support of developing countries. But the climate finance, is it fulfilled in many countries is a very big question even today. And what are the future plans and priorities? So first and foremost point is the efficient management. As we just discussed that there is more challenges and issues related to the disbursement of the fund by itself, there is more need of efficient management which is focusing on immediate and long term support from the loss and damage funds. So in the COP28, the priority was that the climate finance for developing countries has to be improved and which is actually taken from the developed nations because most of the developed nations are actually the reason for the increased climate change today. And this also includes the more efficient operationalization of, this also includes the improved efficiency of loss and damage fund. When we talk about what are all the challenges related to India, both in terms of climate change and tackling the climate change, there are certain factors that we have to take into account. First is weather related damages. Actually from 2019 to 2023, India almost faced $56 billion of damages due to climate change, which is very high compared to our GDP. And there is a lack of standard methods of loss and development funds. There is no clear guidelines. It is very vague which is actually leading to two issues. First is there, this vagueness might lead to delay in disbursement of fund. And second point is there is a possibility that proper funds are not given to the deserving nations. And next focus is the mitigation. So India's national policy is prioritizing mitigation. Actually, we have to prioritize not just mitigation, we should also prioritize on adaptations. 
Next is the advocacy for decentralized disbursement. This is a very important point because whenever it comes to emergency situations, the decentralized disbursement will actually reduce the time taken to disperse any fund because whenever there is an issue, let's say there is a country which is country one, it is in need of any uh, damage support. So let's say they have to go to the central agency and the central agency will take time because they don't know the actual impact what is happening in the country one. It might take time to disperse the required fund. Instead, the decentralization, for example, let's say there is a branches of this particular loss and uh, damage funds in different uh, locations or different geographical locations in the world, it will lead to faster disbursement of funds. So these are the recommendations given by our nation and these are the challenges. Now let's discuss the question related to it. So consider the following statements regarding the loss and damage fund. So first point is the loss and damage fund was established to provide financial support exclusively for small island nation. The World Bank serves as an interim trustee for loss and damage fund and the loss and damage fund primarily focuses on funding mitigation projects. So in this statement, you can see that I have uh, underline the extreme statements. I won't say extreme statements are always wrong, but in this situation, here we talk about small island nation. There is no statement such as small island nation, but the statement is about developing nations. So in this case, the first statement stands wrong. And the second statement is right, the World Bank is serving as an interim trustee for loss and damage fund. And then the primary focus on funding, it's not just mitigation project, it is for the adaptation project also. So in that case, only the second statement stands correct. The next topic we are going to discuss is about our Prime Minister's visit to Singapore. So during this visit, India has flagged a best deal for creating the supply chain related to semiconductor fabrications. So let's discuss this article. So what is this India-Singapore Semiconductor Pact? So this India-Singapore Semiconductor Pact is about a joint collaboration with Memorandum of Understanding on India and Singapore Semiconductor Ecosystem Partnership. So this can be asked as a question, which of the following countries India has signed a Memorandum of Understanding related to Semiconductor Ecosystem Partnership. And we are also focusing on strengthening domestic semiconductor manufacturing ecosystem, which is nothing but based on the recent need. We can see that semiconductors are very important in manufacturing almost every electronic items we need. So in that process, we are more dependent on foreign countries related to this productions. But now we are concentrating more on domestic semiconductor ecosystem. And why is this very important? Two points is very important here. Point number one is that there is a concept called as China plus one strategy. So what is this China plus one strategy? When it comes to semiconductor production, China stands top. So in that situation, most of the countries in the world wants to have a plus one country that is apart from China, who is very strong in terms of semiconductor manufacturing. And second point is that when we have a domestic semiconductor manufacturing ecosystem, India will be self-reliant and in future, we won't have any issue related to any of the critical technologies. So next thing is, what is the significance of semiconductor industry? So semiconductor is the backbone of modern technology technology, which means that most of the hardware parts of any technology we are using today, it let it be like internet of things or let it be talking about uh, artificial intelligence or any kind of technologies of fourth industrial revolution, we need semiconductor there. And the application includes electronics, telecommunication, and we also need uh, in terms of defense, be it automation or be it artificial intelligence, we need semiconductor support. And in terms of power generation also, smartphones, computers, automobiles to missiles, medical devices, everything depends on semiconductors. This can be a question, semiconductor, which of the following in prelims, we can expect this from science and technology, which of the following? has semiconductor in its uh, application, then this we can see that almost all the modern technologies that is the right, that would be the right answer. Now we should discuss the significance of semiconductor industries. It is the backbone of modern technology. When I talk about modern technology, the fourth industrial revolution related technologies, almost everything be it UPI, for UPI we need mobile phones, for mobile phones we need semiconductors and then let it be internet of things, let it be artificial intelligence, let it be automation 
for everything semiconductor forms the base and it is also used in electronics any form of electronics telecommunications automotive defense for everything we need semiconductors here and it is also important in powering smartphones computers automobiles to missiles and then for medical devices also we need for example let's say medical devices we uh, have a glucometer and then we have now uh, electronic uh, blood pressure monitor for everything we need uh, semiconductors this we can expect in science and technology based prelims question where they might ask you which of the following fabrication requires semiconductors and the options like 1 2 3 4 5 6 options might be given we should understand any electronic device will definitely have semiconductors the term electronic means what is the term electronic means is that it is having a semiconductor where the movement of electron is helpful in the operation of that particular device that is the meaning of electronic so this is a major difference between electronic and electric so that is why for any electronic devices if you see a term e which means that it will definitely have semiconductor this is something we should keep it in mind so there is a growing global demand for artificial intelligence 5g internet of things today without even us understanding that it's artificial intelligence without even us understanding internet of things we have so many technologies related to semiconductors it is very important for economic growth and national security because for one point of thing this critical technology is a very big scope for india's economic growth and with the rising tension geopolitical tension among the world the national security is very important and we need semiconductors for that and the global supply chain disruptions so for example if there is any country which we are dependent on semiconductor supply let's say there is an issue in that particular country it will definitely affect the supply of our country's demand so in that case we have to be self-reliant this is why we are having this pact with singapore and uh, there is this concept of digital revolution because today everything is digitalization especially let's say india is one of the most successful country in terms of digital economy Today we are ready to carry our mobile phones and not the wallets to everywhere and for this for internet or for any kind of uh, uh, digitalized form of you know day to day activities we need semiconductors. Geostrategic and economic importance. So it is very crucial for various sectors and importance the supply chain disruptions especially with China as I said China plus one policy is something every country is looking forward to and this is a very good and this is a very good opportunity for India not just to take care of their domestic demand and also this is a place where india can fulfill the international demand so what is india semiconductor mission this is where we are taking the use of this china plus one situation in the world and we are trying to become the global leader in terms of semiconductor manufacturing so it is it has been launched in 2021 with 76000 crore incentive scheme so what is this incentive scheme is production linked incentive this is very important so what is this production linked incentive is that there will be a production uh, limit set and if that production is met by any industry there will be an incentive given by the government it is like a positive reinforcement which can help the industries to be encouraged and improve their efficiency and the cabinet has approved 1.26 lakh crore of investment in terms of India semiconductor mission and we have the partnership with Tata group and Taiwan's power chip semiconductor etc. Taiwan stands the top today in the world in terms of semiconductor manufacturing. And when it comes to Singapore semiconductor industry, Singapore produces 10 percentage of global semiconductor output and 5 percentage of global wafer fabrication capacity. What is this wafer fabrication capacity is nothing but in any chip you see there will be a wafer like a very thin strip of semiconductor and that in terms of wafer production Singapore contributes to the 5 percentage of global capacity and companies like Texas Instruments and National Semiconductors are also from Singapore. And Singapore is the major hub of semiconductor manufacturing of the world. So, what are the key benefits of India coming from this pact? Point number one is it will help in terms of talent development that is nothing but skilling programs for domestic manufacturing and it is India's land and labor cost advantages would attract semiconductor companies. It might be of foreign direct investment which will lead to make in India program where we will get more employment opportunities and we will be having more income to our country. 
and development of equipment and material manufacturing capabilities will also help in terms of fulfilling our domestic demands, taking care of our national security issues and also we might be able to use this opportunity to improve our wealth. But now there are certain challenges along with uh, Singapore's manufacturing industries. First thing is they focus on mature node chips. So what is this mature node chips is? This is not the latest technology. It is somewhat uh, backward in terms of advance advancement, but still it is used in many of the electronic devices today. And uh, the manufacturing capacity of high-end logic chips are very less. So what is a major issue with major node chips is that the size is very uh, big and the speed is also slow. And rising production cost in Singapore is one of the major issue. When there is a high production cost, obviously the product cost also will be higher, which will lead to reduction in the demand. And there is a potential shift of operation to India because of these issues. And this is opening the gate for Singapore-based companies to start their setup here in, in our country. So let us discuss a question based on this. Consider the following artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, satellite communication system. Which of the following applications contain semiconductors? So answer is obviously 1, 2 and 3. I just discussed that any electronic devices will have semiconductors today. You take a, a you know e-device, any e-device, let it be a camera, mobile phone, sometimes we use some pens, all these things contain today uh, semiconductors. We will discuss the next topic. So the next article we are going to discuss is about Maoist setback. So the security forces have delivered major flows to Maoists, but they have to avoid repression. So this is the topic about. So first we have to understand what is left wing extremism. So when it when we talk about left wing extremism, they follow an ideology of Maoism. So what is Naxalism? So Naxalism means they are from the Naxalbari tribe of West Bengal and that is why we call them as Naxals. So from there we call them to be Naxals and this Naxal uprising took place in 1967. So Ministry of Home Affairs, since it's an internal security issue, Ministry of Home Affairs is one who is taking care of this 38 districts across 9 states. So this 38 districts across 9 states is called as Red Corridor. Because of high alert, they have been named as Red Corridor. And this is the map of Red Corridor. We can see the state's name, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Bihar, and West Bengal. These five states form the Red Corridor and this is how we can see how it is forming. This place is called as, this is called as Red Corridor. So what is the cause of left-wing extremism? So this left-wing extremism is actually a vicious cycle. So what causes is that there is an economic, uh, there is an economic cause and governance deficit. Usually where is this extremism taking place is that Whenever they are lacking resources and support from the government, what happens is that they form extremism. So in that case, when there is an extremism, then again it will lead to the lack of support and resources from the government. So here let's see the economic causes is poverty and marginalization, landlessness due to various reasons they have lost their land, illiteracy and lack of basic services like health, education, or any other government services are leading to their extremism against common people and the government. So governance deficit is also a major issue because here the law and order is very weak in remote areas because movement of technology, movement of personnel is very tough in terms of remote areas like dense forests or uh, you know uh, hilly regions. So this is where the law and order is very weak and this is leading to the rise in extremism. Corruption and mismanagement is also a very important issue when it comes to uh, inefficient governance. This is leading to the inefficient services. Even though there are fund allotted, even though there are schemes there, but the service is not effectively delivered to people and this is one of the root cause of extremism. So what is the impact of left-wing extremism? Before going to the impact of left-wing extremism, we should understand one thing. Whenever there is a situation of violence, any number of party can participate in the violence. It might seem like one party is winning the um, uh, event there, but actually the impact is on everyone who has participated in the violence. In that case, here, in terms of extremism, the extremism is to demand certain things from the government. But actually this extremism is hindering development in this particular area. And there is a very big internal security issue because this extremism might spread to the other parts uh, adjacent to that particular area. And innocent people are facing collateral damage here. There are more number of human rights violation in these places like murders, like uh, robbery 
many form of human rights violation is taking place here and violence here extremism is leading to more economic loss for both people and the government and there is hindrance to education and healthcare. So, they are demanding certain basic needs but these basic services are not being able to be provided there because of this extremism there. But what is the government doing here? So, that is a very big question and answer to this is first and foremost thing is rehabilitation program. Even though the security operations like Green Hunt, Cobra are all short term uh, you know solution here, the long term solution is rehabilitation program because they are, the reason, the very reason for the extremism here is the demand for basic services and there are many developmental initiatives like IAP, aspirational district program. So, all these things are improving the efficiency of governance there. And Samadhan strategy, generally what is Samadhan? Samadhan is uh, peace. Samadhan is talking about, uh, you know, coming to a middle path where everybody gets benefited. So, leadership, intelligence, they are trying to improve the technology, they are working more on development and all these things are leading to the proper reduction in the extremism in these particular areas. And the paramilitary forces in combating left wing extremism, this is one of the important questions that can be asked in terms of prelims. Central Reserve Police Force, Border Security Force, Indo-Tibetan Border Police, Sahashtra Seema Bal. So, these four paramilitary forces are also in combating left-wing extremism. So, now let us discuss a question based on left-wing extremism. Point number one, left-wing extremism is primarily driven by socio-economic disparities and land alienation in tribal and underdeveloped areas. The fifth schedule of Indian constitution provides for self-governance in left-wing affected areas. Operation Green Hunt was launched to address left-wing extremism affected areas through the developmental initiatives. So, here the answer is 1 and 2 only is right because Operation Green Hunt is a security initiative, not a development initiative. That is something we have to uh, think. Here the term hunt itself will give us an idea that it is not developmental, it is a security based initiative. And this is about the today's discussion and thank you for everyone watching the video and do like, comment and share this video. Do not forget to subscribe to this channel so that you can get daily newspaper analysis. Thank you.